So it is South by Southwest, and this is Sam here with Stellar Global, where we uh, like to connect our entrepreneurial development community with the Stellar Network. And I have got the head of ecosystems, Justin Rice. How are you doing, sir? Great. How about you? I am doing wonderful, doing wonderful. Um, it's been kind of wild here at South by Southwest. Uh, how are you enjoying it so far? So far, it's been great. I've eaten tacos. I have yet to eat barbecue. Ah. But I also went to this session, tried to go to this session earlier today. It was called 2022, the year of the Dow, right across the hall. And I was just so surprised at how many people just appeared to go to that session all at once. I didn't even make it in, right? Really? Oh, and I man. feel like that, like I thought it was quiet this morning and now I look around and there's just like tons of energy, tons of people doing great stuff. And I feel like that's the cool thing about getting together in person is that you're just sort of like uh, bumping up against like a lot of interesting people doing interesting things and you can kind of feel the energy. Yeah. How about you? Man, it, it's been great. I mean, you know, talking about energy, it's like, you know, really seeing everyone here at the SDF as well. I mean, you know, I've been following, you know, the team for a couple of years now, so I've seen it grown. Yeah. And without a doubt, the ecosystem has a real purposeful growth. Um, how we talk about a little bit about that, you know, the entire SDF has kind of grown, the DevRel team I've seen expand. Yep. Um, what insight can you give for everyone listening in of, of, of where you guys have expanded in that, in that area? Um, I mean, SDF as a whole has grown a lot in response to the growing ecosystem. You know, as there are more people using Stellar and as there are more ambitions to turn it into like this sort of fundamental payment layer that connects the world's financial infrastructure, there's more work to do and more work means we need more people and having more people sort of helps create momentum. And so there's a snowball effect going on. And we're growing across all the different teams and SDF is also becoming a bit more structured as we do. And so one of the teams that I work with a lot is, is the team that you're mentioning, the DevRel team. DevRel they're, team. They're all here today. And like, you know, the DevRel team, their goal is to sort of engage, educate, and, uh, and sort of help developers grow, support developers as they use Stellar. And so they're working a lot on creating you know, hackathons and, and content for amb uh, Stellar ambassadors and uh, documentation and these sort of multi, uh, these sort of one-to-many resources that they can use to help people who are out there, people who are watching, like understand how to use Stellar and also to support them as they experiment and grow and work on stuff. And so that's one, you know, that team specifically is here right now and they've, they've grown a lot and they're building a lot more structure. And I think over the coming, you know, over the next six months, like right now they've kind of been working on these um, fundamental resources that they can d start to deploy, mm -hmm. right? So con like I mentioned, content kits and this Stellar Quest Learn, which is a gamified intro to Stellar, um, a couple other components. And I think starting very soon, what you'll see is that they'll be able to sort of go out and use them to like sort of evangelize and energize and empower people outside of SDF. Uh, and I think we'll see a lot more of sort of being out there in the world for that team, talking to more people, going to more conferences, doing this kind of thing. And I think that that's just an example mm -hmm. of how having more people and uh, more focus and more demand allows us to start to reach wider. And I think it's really gonna help the SDF support the growth and development of Stellar. So. Now, in addition to the DevRel team, I think uh, another area that I've seen a lot of growth in is been on the business development side. Yeah. Um, as equally, while the the SDF core team has been really growing, it <clears throat> definitely opens up some opportunities to yeah. help other businesses to come and utilize the network. And we've seen some really great investments from the enterprise team. Um, what kind of insights can you can you give? Because I, you know, those companies are you know part of the ecosystem. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think that SDF serves. We we serve a lot. So it's important, right, that we the foundation are just one player in the ecosystem. Right. Obviously, we're an important player, but we're not by any means the only player, and we're not even the most important player. Like it's all of the people out there who are building novel solutions and innovative. Um, sort of uh, uh, taking innovative, innovative use cases and finding ways to use Stellar to solve for those use cases, those are the people that are the most important. And a lot of what we can do as a foundation is, yeah, invest in them because we do have, you know, we do have these lumen allocations that we need to give out in order to grow the ecosystem. And also we can serve as a connector, right? Like we can provide technical assistance. We can um, introduce different ecosystem companies together. We can do these kinds of things that make it possible
possible for the, for that ecosystem to like find each other and to be more empowered. And so a lot of what we do on the investment side and on the BD side is really to help sort of like support um, all of the great things that other companies are already doing. But it's just a really important thing that like so much of the key developments, in fact, pretty much all the key developments that happen on top of Stellar and the ecosystem, those are done by other great people, you know, that we have the fortune of being able to interact with. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what I think of is that our role is, is supportive. Um, it's to engage, it's to support, it's to talk, it's to connect. Uh, and it's really cool to be able to do that because so many of these companies are so inspiring. Right, right, right. And I've had a chance to meet uh, many of them that I've been here. And uh, really excited to see, you know, see the, see the community continue to explore. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I want to talk to you about is something that I think is really unique and special about the Stellar Network. Since, I mean, it started, what, 2014? Yep. There have been 18 protocol upgrades. I mean, that's huge. 18 protocol upgrades when there's a lot of networks that are still trying to get there first. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the process in which that happens on the Stellar Network, I think, is, is unique and um, something that maybe people outside don't know, you know. So if you can maybe share the process of, of how um, we go, we have SEPs, CAPs, and uh, eventual uh, protocol upgrades, I think that would be great. Sure, yeah. So... Protocol upgrades are an opportunity to take Stellar Core, which is the fundamental underlying software that runs the Stellar network, the, all the validating nodes on the networks that they run to sort of like keep the common ledger. So Stellar Core is, a, is just a computer program that can, be up, that can be amended. You can add new features to it. Um, and so whenever we upgrade the protocol, it's an opportunity to take what was there, the sort of base layer of features that made up Stellar, and to, and to add new functionality to it. Um, and so the question is, like, how and why do you do that? So okay. I guess I'll start with why. The reason why you want to add new features is m most of the time because there's demand for them. Um, the ecosystem, the people who are building on Stellar, they say, Stellar is great. It would be better if we could also do this. And so that demand will basically start to drive a process where people think about how to answer the demand by making some modification to the Stellar core code. And then there's a very public uh, and very specific route that any change takes. So basically, an idea will come from the ecosystem. There'll be a discussion, an open discussion on the, um, there's a developer mailing list, Stellar Dev, it's a Google group. There's usually an open discussion there, asynchronous, right? So people are writing back and forth on the mailing list. Eventually, someone will take that idea and they will write a very specific technical proposal. It's called a CAP, a core advancement proposal. And that will basically like outline exactly what the change is, how it would work, and we'll even give like sort of a high level blueprint of how the code would be implemented. Um, that cap goes through, again, like that's the draft of the cap is then discussed on the mailing list. It's iterated on based on feedback that comes in. It goes into like this protocol meeting where certain um, people, most of whom are from SDF, but not all of whom are always from SDF, like sort of have a synchronous discussion. Mm -hmm. Those Protocol meetings are things that we live stream so that people can follow along. And after it's been iterated on enough times, there's actually a committee of three people that will basically vote to approve a core advancement proposal. And it moves then from its draft stage to its approval, approval stage. I know I'm getting real technical, but are just really in the weeds a little bit. But I think just seeing that it's like a concrete process Absolutely. is like helpful. Okay, so at this point, it's been approved goes into a final comment period where anyone can basically raise final questions. And if there are no questions in that final comment period, it moves on to like this approved phase. And then the Stellar core team actually implements it. Once a protocol change, a new feature is like implemented in the Stellar core code, it gets bundled up into a new major protocol release. So right now we're on protocol 18. The next one will be protocol 19. But it actually doesn't go live on the network right, until the validators on the network vote to accept that change. Mm -hmm. And so there's a programmatic part, there's a way that you can just arm your validator to say, at a certain time, like you download this new version of Stellar Core, right? Okay. Only it's latent, all the new features are latent in it, it's not turned on. And then all the validators will arm their nodes at a certain point, and they'll say, you know, at like five o'clock on, you know, f uh, March 17th, I want the network to start running protocol 19 instead mm -hmm. of protocol 18. And at that moment, if enough validators basically broadcast that same message, the network flips over to the new protocol. The interesting point of all this is like, there's a process driven by ecosystem demand. It's all very open and you can follow along and anyone out there can like sort of contribute or engage in the discussion. 
And in the end, any change is ultimately ratified through the network governance by validators agreeing to accept the change. And so it's kind of cool. Like, this is how open source works. It's not, right. it's not a decision that SDF makes. It's not a decision that one person makes. It's, a decision, it's like a series of decisions and discussions that lead us to a conclusion that ultimately requires the network's approval in order to turn on, which is pretty cool. And any validator can, can vote on these? And you know what I love about Stellar is that you know it's it's really it's it's really open to anybody to just you know become a validator and participate. There's no like real you know hurdles. You know like maybe some other networks. It's really open to everybody. Yeah, Stellar by design is n the validation, right? So when we talk about validation, what we're talking about are these nodes that run the software that keeps a common ledger mm -hmm. and the protocol that they sort of like keep the rules that they follow to add new transactions to the ledger. Right. So they got to stay in sync and they got to say like, okay, we're, we got these, the, we, here's the state of accounts and balances, but now we're going to, you know, a, a, all these people are submitting payments, so we're going to update the ledger by accepting all the valid payments. Now we have a new state of the ledger. Now process of validation, right, is what we're talking about. Right. Um, and it's interesting because a lot of networks that have different, in order to validate, there has to be some consensus mechanism, some method for all those nodes to come to agreement. Yes, let's apply these transactions. They're valid. So, like, that consensus is achieved through a consensus protocol. And um, a lot of other consensus protocols, proof of work is the one that Bitcoin uses, for instance. They, they really favor um, specialized hardware, for instance. Like, if you want to mine Bitcoin and participate in consensus, you really get a specialty computer that costs a lot of money mm. and you those are the anyone who's mining is like has become a, a specialist in the art of mining and has specialized hardware stellar's meant to run validators are really meant to run on more like sort of modest regular non-specialized equipment that's, right that's huge so everybody can run a validator but the difference is that at some point the more like sort of um your and, and when you run a validator let me say that you identify yourself as the runner of the person who runs the validator. So validators aren't anonymous. They're run by entities or individuals that basically like say, this is my validator, right? So mm -hmm. um, the more that other validators on the network trust your validator by basically configuring their validator to listen to yours, the more important your validator becomes in the network. And so the, the sort of ratification of transactions the weight of ratification, the amount that your vote like really matters, is determined by real-world reputation. So right. organizations, individual, generally organizations, businesses that have better reputations, they get added to more quorum sets. Like th they get listened to by more validators. And so, the way that the Stellar Consensus Protocol works, it really um, leverages real-world reputation to validate transactions, which is very different, right? Because you can. Anyone can join and anyone can establish a good reputation. And it's the, the, that sort of openness makes it so that it's all about rewarding good behavior as opposed to other consensus protocols. Like stake, proof of stake. Yeah, where it's, where it's rewarding you for owning the most of a token, <laughs> right? So it's, ideally, it's a sort of this virtuous cycle, right? Like if you behave well, if you are a trustworthy validator, you, get, you, you accrue trust and that gives you more mm -hmm. import in the network. Um, and all of that's like pretty cool. I feel like it's an I optimistic so. view of of the world where you can anyone can join and anyone can grow and anyone can improve and anyone can get their can like sort of gr get their reputation um, uh, increased by good. Be that, 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 that's the way I want the world to work. You know? I, I like that creating a inclusive open network and community. Yeah, that that that's exactly how you do it. I think. Um, you know, I, I took some notes here because, you know, you talked about some of these different protocol upgrades. And I yeah. was hoping maybe to go back to a few, sure. bring up some of the highlights and get your take on the importance of, of these things being added. So cool. uh, last year we had protocol 17, right? And so that introduced asset clawback. Um, explain exactly what that is and, and maybe some possible use cases on the Stellar network. Yeah, sure. Protocol 17, asset clawback. So asset clawback was, um, the need was identified and the actual cap was drafted by an ecosystem company called Securency. Um, and they actually had a client that they wanted to issue a regulated asset for. 
And um, so, and, and for, for, for those listening, when you, when you say, when you classify as a regulated asset, um, what, what, what does that usually entail? There are all different kinds of regulated assets, and these would be, um, so one example would be like a Reg D asset in the United States. Mm-hmm. If you have an asset that is, say, a share in a private corp- company that, um, in, that only accredited investors can hold. Okay. There's a, regu- there's a regulatory, there's an entity that regulates these kinds of assets. There are mm-hmm. rules about who can hold them. And in this case, in that specific case, like a regulated asset, you would have to sort of prove that you were an accredited investor before you were allowed to hold it. Right? Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So, and that's somewhat like the case that, that, that the specific case that sort of brought um, claw back to light uh, as, as a necessary feature. So let me just step back and say, Stellar has built in asset controls Asset wow. issuers can turn on certain flags um, that sort of make it so that uh, they have different levels of control over their assets. So the most, uh, the original one is just called auth required, authorization required. Okay. With an auth required flag, you basically say, I, the asset issuer, have to grant an account the, the authorization before it can hold my asset, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened was that the, the people, uh, you know, in, in this case, the ecosystem pointed out that there are other different levels of asset control that would be helpful in order to comply with regulations, one of which is the ability to claw back an asset. So it, beyond just having an asset be auth required, you can also turn on a flag that says that an asset is clawback enabled. And that means that if someone holds, uh, when someone holds an asset, the issuer can claw back their balance. They can take it back from them. Um, now, I know this, people have been listening right now, and the first thing they're going to think to themselves is, wait a minute, yeah. I've got some USDC, uh, I've got some XLM in my wallet. Does this mean that someone could just take it back? Right. No, that's, <laughs> no. A, that's a really good question. So, um, the, in order, like, uh, assets that are marked clawback enabled, they have to be, when they are issued, the issuer has to turn on this bright flag, bright red flag, essentially, that says, this asset is clawback enabled. Mm-hmm. And so when a user says, I will hold that asset, which they have to opt into holding it, they have to say, I, I agree to hold that asset, they see flashing red sign. And, and also I think it's important too is that, I mean, the notion of callbacks is not new. It's no, not, no, yeah, it's, yeah, not. It, it, it's it, not. It's not new at all. Yeah, and, so, yeah. and I just want to find, like, uh, there is, you, if you already hold an asset, someone can't, you can't be sneaky. You right. can't come in and turn on the callback flag and claw it back. So basically you go in eyes wide open if you're going to hold one of these assets, you know that it's callback enabled. Clawbacks is really the, the, this creation of clawbacks on chain via this new feature, it's really to mirror something that already oh, exists in the world. Which is cool. Um, and it's for a lot of the times it would be for like, uh, um, I guess for clawbacks specifically, to comply with regulations, sometimes for instance, you have to be able to, if there's a, if there's a, a mistaken payment, it goes to the wrong person. Um, if there's someone who comes under sanction, uh, mm-hmm. those are two examples where like actual regulatory authorities have to know, right, that that the asset that you're issuing is that you can claw it back. So in order to comply with regulations in some jurisdictions for certain kinds of assets, you have to be able to prove to a regulatory entity that clawback is possible. Um, so as far as I know, like clawback is, is it opens, it sort of allows people to show that they, it, it's a compliance friendly feature that Stellar has built in. So it allows people to issue a type of asset that they didn't feel comfortable issuing before. Right. But it, you know, it's not, it doesn't allow people to do things with existing assets at all. Like it doesn't, it's not retroactively applied to anything. It would be for something. It's for new kinds of assets. Which is, which is exciting, especially, I mean, we just had the executive order being put in. I mean, you know, it's, it's great to see that Stellar has been ahead of the game of making sure that um, doing the best they can to uh, have a regulatory friendly environment. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I guess I'll just say that like one of the cool things that Stellar allows is there's a real advantage to issuing assets on open and public networks, right? You can actually, this is pretty, uh, pretty big part of how you can solve for the siloed payment systems of the world, ah, okay. right? If, if there's a network that connects everything and it's all open and anyone can get on it and anyone can issue any kind of assets, you can start to plug everything into this one network and it's the, it's the connective tissue. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is that there are oftentimes regulations that just say, well, we love an open network, but you can't, like, you can't just have assets going to anyone because, mm-hmm. you know, there are, say, you know, anti-money laundering or anti-terrorist right, finance laws. Right, right, right. Um, and so these asset, uh, these issuer controls that allow people to control access to their assets in different ways, there are, there are several of them, mm-hmm. um, 
they allow people to issue assets on an open network that still can meet these regulatory um, compliance requirements. And so that's cool, right? Because it's a way to have, to get the advantages of an open network and a solve for some of the issues that people have uh, with, and by this I mean a lot of regulatory agencies have mm -hmm. with blockchain, right? Because the asset issuer can retain some sort of level of control to comply with local laws and regulations. That's great. So it's, um, it's like the advantages of an open public network with the ability to have that customization, you know, for banks, governments, what have you, regulatory um, of, a, of a private network. I think that's that's right. I, I think that's special. Yeah, I think that, I think that's real special. Um, let, let, let's go on. I mean, so uh, later on we had Protocol 18. Big now one. that was a big one. One of the main uh, introductions was AMM functionalities. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that. Sure, AMM functionality. So AMM stands for Automated Market Maker. Um, automated Market Makers are something that really came out of the DeFi space and they were very, very successful on other networks. Um, a big example is Uniswap. Uniswap is an automated market maker that's built on Ethereum. And Uniswap essentially made it very easy for uh, users to provide liquidity and to swap against that liquidity. And uh, a lot of liquidity got deposited into Uniswap. So um, Automated Market Makers are something that the Stellar ecosystem saw in other networks and said Stellar should have these built in. So from the beginning, from its inception, um, Stellar Book has had, uh, no, Stellar, Stellar has had order books um, built in at the protocol level. And these are like sort of the, tr the legacy style markets that you can see if you go to any crypto trading platform or yeah. the New York Stock Exchange. So they sort of, people put in buy and sell orders and they get stacked into a book. And as the orders cross, trades execute. Um, these order books are very, uh, they, they, they're, they're highly functional and they're easy to, they're pretty intuitive. Like once you see them in action, you can sort of understand how they work, mm -hmm. but they have some problems. Um, the problem with order books is the, the, that it's hard to generate a lot of liquidity. Right. And on Stellar, if you imagine, you know, again, Stellar is a platform that allows anyone to issue an asset and that allows these markets to exist between assets so you can transform currency, right? Mm -hmm. So you can swap from one currency to another. Any liquidity that exists in the outside world has to be sort of recreated on the network for the network to really function. And so if you're really going to make it so that Stellar can handle the payment volume of the world, become like this massive player in sort of the payment space, you would need to generate just a ton, ton, ton of liquidity. So order books, the problem is that the, in order to maintain order books, you need inventory up front to put in the, the buy and sell orders. Um, you need to maintain those order books with like a really high degree of accuracy, so you're constantly updating your orders. And to do both those things, it require that the level of complexity required to do that, um, and the capital that you need in order to do it. It really means that order book market making, right? Like actually creating liquidity on order books. Mm -hmm. That's generally the the sort of purview of professional market makers. It's too complicated right. for individuals to become part of it. So automated market makers, like I said, they were introduced with Uniswap, and they, instead of having you manually enter all these orders on a book, they allow you to create a liquidity pool and to have that liquidity pool generate um, sort of, that you can trade against the pool and the prices that the pool quotes are determined by an algorithm. And so from a user point of view, you can just deposit into the pool and let the pool sort of keep, keep itself consistent and quote the prices and execute the trades. And so the level of, the fact that you can deposit smaller amounts of capital very easily, mm -hmm. and the fact that the pool like sort of takes care of all the details, um, means that it's way less complex and way easier for individuals to sort of pool their money into these pools. And so it becomes a way to democratize market making. So protocol 18, we mm -hmm. essentially added a native uh, AMM capability to Stellar in order to bootstrap more liquidity on the network. And Get an alert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's been, it's been uh, alerts going on all over. So, you know, let me ask you this. I mean, what has been the, um, I guess from a high level, some of the, like, have you guys seen a, an impact on the network since the introduction of AMMs? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, we have definitely seen more liquidity for more asset pairs. Um, Good. And we've seen a lot more people depositing. So I, I don't have the stats in front of me. Probably like the best place to just look at, at AMM stats is um, StellarX, which is a third-party interface that um, you know, we, the foundation, didn't build. But somebody built, you know, it's a third-party interface that was built that gives you access to like 
the high, the sort of training functionality of Stellar. Okay, they right. have a really good AMM dashboard, so like if anyone's watching, I'd go check that out. But um, basically, a lot of what you can see is this. One, a lot of different accounts have deposited into liquidity pools, mm -hmm. thousands. So wow. thousands of people wow. are providing liquidity that weren't before. Two, there's been a, a, a big boost, uh, especially in like long tail assets. So there are now liquidity pools for all different pairs that didn't exist before. And that's cool because that is, that is, yeah. like part of the thing about the professional automated market makers, right, that I was talking about before is that for them, they don't, they tend to focus on pairs where there is a high volume of trading because they make their money off of just the bid ask spread. So they want really high volumes. And so they're drawn to these very like sort of pillar mm -hmm. um, market pairs, right? Because that's where they have the best chance of like sort of earning, earning, uh, earning money. Right. Um, but for these, AMMs, and so there's a lot of asset pairs that are just outside their interest. They're not going to be interested in making, you know, between like sort of less well-traded currencies. Mm -hmm. And so it means that they, they provide this sort of core middle of liquidity, but on, on the tails where the assets are not those key, you know, banner assets, um, they're less used, but equally important, especially when you put them all together. Right. AMMs, we're seeing a lot of liquidity pools created for those asset pairs that were previously overlooked. So nice. more people, more pairs with liquidity, and in general, just like an increase in the amount of, of um, liquidity that, pe that people are providing by depositing into the pools. No, that's neat. I mean, so we talked about 17, 18, yeah. and I've been following online, and it looks like we have another protocol upgrade around the corner, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, and um, I know we have a couple, it's, uh, you got, Cap 21 and cap 40, is that correct? Yeah, and possibly cap 42. And possibly 42. All right, so let's go through them a little bit. So what, 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 we, oh, got, yeah. what we got going on here? Yeah, so, I mean, Protocol 19 is still in the in the implementation stage. And it's, mm -hmm. so this isn't going to happen this week. I, I have a feeling it'll probably, they'll probably release Stellar Core 19 sometime in like April, so okay. the network will probably upgrade late May, that, but that's not set in stone, but you know, so we got several months. Right. So okay. what, what is protocol 19? Like I said, these protocol changes are a chance to implement new features. The two that you mentioned, which are 21 and 40, these are both related to payment channels. So mm. um, there is <laughs> this idea of, of, there's a project that, that it's been kicking around for a long time called Starlight. We've all heard of Starlight. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And like it sort of started, it started outside of SDF. A company called Interstellar was working on it. Sort of a lot of people left that were working on it. Recently, someone at SDF sort of picked it up again and mm -hmm. started experimenting with payment channels and um, built some prototypes. And if you go look at the Meridian uh, Dev Talks, for instance, yes. technical talks, there's yes, yes, yes. Lee, Lee McCulloch um, gives one on Starlight. Shout out to Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and, and in order to make start that prototype work, he, there were two different um, changes to the core protocol that needed to happen, CAP21 and CAP40. And I mean, without getting too technical, CAP21 changes some, uh, like generalizes transaction preconditions. Okay. Um, CAP40 adds a new kind of signer that makes it easier for multiple parties to like sort of sign a Stellar transaction. But what these things do is they essentially make it so that you can have transactions going along on the main ledger and you can sort of break off and have a payment channel and have two parties interact and have transactions off ledger hmm. and then later come back and settle on ledger. And there are just Ooh. some changes to the way that transactions work that you need to do to like sort of be able to open it up, pull out a payment channel and then reconnect it later. <laughs> Uh, and so I think that... It's just amazing how they, they, you guys just like put all the stuff together to me. That's it's pretty, really cool. That and is this pretty one's cool. I've got to say, <laughs> Protocol 19 is cool because payment channels are cool and it would allow basically an increase in overall network throughput by moving certain transactions to like between two individual parties off of the chain and they could periodically settle, right? So this would be really cool. It's a really tech... These caps mm -hmm. are really technical. Um, they're quite hard to follow and I, I often just have to remind <laughs> myself, okay, I'm in the weeds, I'm trying to understand, I spend a lot of time reading these things and trying right. to understand them, but I'm not like, I'm not Lee, I'm not a protocol designer myself, right? Like I'm okay. more of a generalist, right? So I, uh, in this case, I'm like, man, 
<laughs> I just got to remember these are for payment channels. <laughs> right, 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 right. So I think protocol 19 will be like the Starlight protocol, payment channel protocol. I, I mean, first of all, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people listening and watching this right now are like, man, it must be pretty big if we're getting that reaction from you. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it'd be cool. I, I, you know, the other one that we've been talking about a lot that just, I think is just about to get, uh, so, you know, remember we talked about that, the stages that CAP goes through, like, there's a an, CAP an 42, which is something that we discussed recently in these open protocol meetings, is out for the CAP committee to vote on, right? So I think it's going to be accepted and move into final comment period soon. Is that is that SpeedX? No, CAP no? 42 is cool. It's the it's a fees cap, and basically, mm. right now, you know the way that fees work on Stellar, all transactions sort of get thrown into an auction um, to when there's Basically, transactions on Stellar, there's a minimum transaction fee. And if there's no contention for ledger space, right? If there's right. enough room in the ledger for a given ledger for every transaction to make it, everyone just gets charged the minimum fee. But if there's contention, right? There's more transactions trying to get applied to the ledger than there's space for. Uh -huh. um, then it, the transactions move into like an auction mode, surge pricing. But it uses a, basically surge, a, version, right, 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 okay. a, a yeah. version of a Dutch auction, right? So like the fee that you specify when you submit it anyway. All transactions, they just are either, you know, they sort of go into the same auction. Mm -hmm. CAP 42 actually allows validators to start to bucket transactions into different types and to charge different fees for different kinds of transactions. And here's what's cool about that. That's already cool. <laughs> right. Like validators on Stellar, they're not incentivized by fees. They don't get paid with fees. Right. They don't have an interest in driving fees up. There's no stakeholder interest for the validators in having high transaction fees. That's part of why transaction fees on Stellar are low. So low, okay. Yeah. But, like, it also means that they can, as a group, you know, help determine how to shape network traffic. So if you are, are building on Stellar, you know, you might notice, like, over the past few years, there have been times when the ledger's gotten really crammed with people with these, like, failed arbitrage yes. transactions. Yes, yeah, that was, uh, that, that was pretty, that was a big discussion item not so long ago. Yeah, and, and so part of the issue can be if a bunch of people are trying to, like, basically claim these tiny arbitrage opportunities on Stellar, mm -hmm. they, they compete for ledger space with people who are trying to make cross-border payments, right? Right, 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 right. And so with CAP42, it, it, it allows validators to start to separate the types of transactions and say, you know what, let's make sure pay, cross-border payments, the fees are lower, and we can raise the fees for this other kind of transaction. That's, that's so they'll dope. be able to shape network traffic. Dope. I like which that. I think will be really, really awesome. I think it will really... Like, it's going to take a second to sink in. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's also cool because it goes back to this thing that we were talking about where validators vote to upgrade the network. It puts governance in the hands of, of the validators, Man. which is pretty, pretty that, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got, I wasn't expecting to hear that one. That, that, that's a good one. I like that. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't heard that one, so that's great. Yeah, it's I'm cool. Excited Check about it out. It. Cap 42. I Cap 42. Just, a lot of the times with these caps, there's like, they'll have a name. I think that one's, it's called. I forgot, I forgot what it's called. They'll have some title, and, you, and you're just like, I don't know what that is. Right, means, right, you know? right, right. I'm sure I've seen it, you know? <laughs> yeah, but then you got to <laughs> dig through it. And, and it, that one's actually interesting because I remember one discussion was like, I, I read, you know, a, a cap has this very specific format, and part of it's like purpose, you know, and it's, or it's supposed to be a simple description, right? Mm -hmm. And the original description, I was like, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> but then someone was like, you know, I think Nicola uh, Barry, who wrote the cap, someone was like, Nico, I think, I think this description is too hard. It should be simpler. He went back and rewrote it, and I read his second iteration on the description, and I was like, light bulb. Wow. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty dope. I like that one. I, I like that one. I like that one. Um, so that was 42. I mentioned SpeedX. Yeah. yeah that's 44. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. 44. Yeah. So is, so is SpeedX and the same as the payment channel, or is no. it something completely different? No, it's something different. And I got to say, like, the payment channel stuff, the Starlight stuff, that is... Going, you know, that is being um, implemented right now, and that's going to be in, in Protocol 19. Okay. SpeedX is a is a relatively new idea, and it's much earlier in the process. Okay. Where like, I've you know a lot of questions have come up that have not yet been answered, and so unlike something like the Starlight stuff, where I can say, okay, that's going in Protocol 19. I understand how it works. It's getting implemented. SpeedX is. I, we don't even know yet if it's going to actually stick, right? So it's in this iteration stage where we're, 
it's a proposal that somebody has that's really just starting to get discussed. And if you join that Stellar Dev mailing list, mm -hmm. right, you'll see that there's all these open questions, and it's it's not always clear that those questions are going to get resolved. Right. So the right, first right. thing I want to say is like, Speedex is interesting. It's not at the point where it's like clearly accepted or anything yet. Okay. There's these open questions and an open discussion. I think anyone who's interested should join it and see that discussion unfold. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Just to see that discussion. Um, you know, I, I think that's. I think if there's if there's one thing, I mean, just listen to you, you chat today. Um, to get out to the community is to get on these mailing lists. Yeah. Um, you know, they want your involvement. They want to hear your feedback. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's really cool because even like you know, let's say the ability for validators to have different fees. I, I know that's a conversation that I've seen in Stellar Global. I I know I've seen that and, and, and heard that discussed. Um, and so I'm sure that there's, there's other communities out there. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Stellar Global, we, we focus on a lot of business use cases, right? So yeah. folks that are looking to build businesses, entrepreneurs, um, minded, you know, sort of uh, avenues. But there are a lot of different communities out there within, you know, stuff. There's, there are those like, um, like JPEG DAO that are kind of focused on the art community and they're, what they're dealing with, um, you know, with uh, NGOs and, and nonprofits. And so, you know, so folks like that, if you have ideas and as you're building your community use cases, you know, you definitely want to get involved with, um, with the development discussion because you're, you know, you're seeing pain points that maybe, you know, maybe I'm not seeing, maybe, you know, others aren't seeing in, in, in SDF. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I know you're right. Like, it is super, <laughs> <laughs> it is super important to understand, like, if you're out there you, building on Stellar, you are the user of the network. Right. And you're right. the person that, you know, the protocol, those changes to the protocol, for instance, or even to the API layer to Horizon or to the SDKs, like all of the tooling that SDF and others in the ecosystem work on, it's really there to serve your needs. And so sometimes it's hard to actually understand what people's pain points are. Um, it's not as easy to get feedback. It's not as obvious what people are going through. Right. So I think one thing that I want to do that is do exactly what you're saying, like encourage people to join mailing lists, but also I, I understand it's, it's on us too. Like I want to find better ways for us to hear, listen, reach out to people. Um, and I think Stellar Global is awesome because you've been doing such a great job connecting. Appreciate it. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, that's what we need. We just, the more we can connect, there's still a lot of shaping to do. We're still early, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a like the more feedback the more participation, the more this technology is going to like actually go where it needs to go. No, that, that's good. You know, one of the things I've been trying to doing, um, we started like an NFT uh, Twitter space. Maybe I'm thinking we might need to do one for devs too, you know, and, and really just try to, you know, open up that conversation um, to, to folks that are, that are building and other use cases to get their thoughts out there. So yeah, that'd be awesome. It, it, it's really been awesome talking with you, uh, Justin. It, it really has always been a pleasure. Um, once again, uh, this is Sam Stellar Global. Um, just connecting the community um, to conversations just like this so you can learn um, how to get involved, what's going on. Um, this weekend, we have the 48-hour hackathon going on that the SDF has been hosting. Um, a lot of great submissions, tons out there. Uh, I can't wait to look through them myself. I get to uh, luckily be a part of some of the judging, so I'm it's looking forward to it. Yeah. yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Sam. Um, everybody continue to watch. We're going to be doing these all weekend. Um, we got a lot of folks lined up. So appreciate you. Thank awesome. you so much. Thanks, Sam. Take care.